Part three of chapter four of The Logic of Hegel by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by William Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Smallwood. Chapter four Second Attitude of Thought to Objectivity. B. The practical reason is understood by Kant to mean the thinking will, i.e., a will that determines itself on universal principle. Its office is to give objective, imperative laws of freedom, laws, that is, which state what ought to happen. The warrant for thus assuming thought to be an activity which makes itself felt objectively, that is, to be really a reason, is the alleged possibility of proving practical freedom by experience, that is, of showing it in the phenomenon of self consciousness this experience in consciousness is at once met by all that the necessitarian produces from contrary experience particular by the sceptical induction employed amongst others by hume from the endless diversity of what men regard as right and duty i e from the diversity apparent in those professedly objective laws of freedom what then is to serve as the law which the practical reason embraces and obeys and as the criterion in its act of self-determination there is no rule at hand but the same abstract identity of understanding as before there must be no contradiction in the act of self-determination hence the practical reason never shakes off the formalism which is represented as the climax of the theoretical reason but this practical reason does not confine the universal principle of good to its own inward regulation it first becomes practical in the true sense of the word when it insists on the good being manifested in the world with an outward objectivity and requires that the thought shall be objective throughout and not merely subjective we shall speak of this postulate of the practical reason afterwards the free self-determination which kant denied to the speculative he has expressly vindicated for the practical reason to many minds this particular aspect of the kantian philosophy made it welcome and that for good reasons to estimate rightly what we owe to kant in the matter we ought to set before our minds the form of practical philosophy and in particularly of moral philosophy which prevailed in his time it may generally be described as a system of eudaimonism which when asked what man's chief end ought to be replied happiness and by happiness eudaimonism understood the satisfaction of the private appetites wishes and wants of the man thus raising the contingent and particular into a principle for the will and its actualization to this eudaimonism which was destitute of stability and consistency and which left the door and gate wide open for every woman caprice kant opposed the practical reason and thus emphasized the need for principle of will which should be universal and lay the same obligation on all the theoretical reason as has been made evident in the preceding paragraphs is identified by kant with the negative faculty of the infinite and as it has no positive content of its own it is restricted to the function of detecting finitude of experiential knowledge to the practical reason on the contrary he is expressly allowed a positive infinity by ascribing to the will the power of modifying itself in universal modes i e by thought such a power the will undoubtedly has and it is well to remember that man is free only in so far as he possesses it and avails himself of it in his conduct but a recognition of the existence of this power is not enough and does not avail to tell us what are the contents of the will or practical reason hence to say that a man must make the good the content of his will raises the question what that content is and what are the means of ascertaining what good is nor does one get over the difficulty by the principle that the will must be consistent with itself or by the precept to do duty for the sake of duty c the reflective power of judgment is invested by kant with the function of intuitive understanding that is to say whereas the particulars had hitherto appeared so far as the universal or abstract identity was concerned adventitious and incapable of being deduced from it the intuitive understanding apprehends the particulars as moulded and formed by the universal itself experience presents such universalized particulars in the products of art and of organic nature the capital feature in kant's criticism of the judgment is that in it he gave a representation and a name if not even an intellectual expression to the idea such a representation as intuitive understanding or an inner adaptation suggests a universal which is at the same time apprehended as essentially a concrete unity it is in these a pursues alone that kantian philosophy rises to the speculative height schiller and others have found in the idea of artistic beauty when thought and sensuous conception have grown together into one a way of escaping from the abstract and separatist understanding others have found the same relief in the perception and consciousness of life and of living things whether that life be natural or intellectual the work of art as well as the living individual 
is it must be owned a limited content but in the postulated harmony of nature or necessity and free purpose in the final purpose of the world conceived as realised kant had put before us the idea comprehensive even in its content yet what may be called the laziness of thought when dealing with the supreme idea finds a too easy mode of evasion in what ought to be instead of the actual realisation of the ultimate end it clings hard to the disjunction of the notion from reality yet if thought cannot think the ideal realised the senses and the intuition can at any rate see it in the present reality of living organisms and of the beautiful in art and consequently kant's remarks on the objects were well adapted to lead the mind on to grasp and think the concrete idea we are thus led to conceive a different relation between the universal understanding and the particular of perception than that which the theory of theoretical and practical reason is founded but while this is so it is not supplemented by a recognition that the former is the genuine relation and the very truth instead of that the unity of universal with particular is accepted only as it exists in finite phenomena and is adduced only as a fact of experience such experience at first only personal may come from two sources it may spring from genius the faculty which produces aesthetic ideas meaning by aesthetic ideas the picture thoughts of free imagination which subserve an idea and suggest thoughts although their content is not expressed in a notional form and even admits of no such expression it may also be due to taste the feeling of congruity between the free play of intuition or imagination and the uniformity of understanding the principle by which the reflective faculty of judgment regulates and arranges the products of animated nature is described as the end or final cause the notion in action the universal at once determining and determining in itself at the same time kant is careful to discard the conception of external or finite adaptation in which the end is only an adventitious form for the means and material in which it is realised in the living organism on the contrary the final cause is a moulding principle and an energy imminent in the matter and every member is in its turn a means as well as an end such an idea evidently radically transforms the relation which the understanding institutes between means and ends between subjectivity and objectivity and yet in the face of this unification the end or design is subsequently explained to be a cause which exists and acts subjectively i e as our idea only and teleology is accordingly explained to be only a principle of criticism purely personal to our understanding after the critical philosophy had settled that reason can know phenomena only there would still have been an option for animated nature between the two equally subjective modes of thoughts even according to kant's own exposition there would have been an obligation to admit in the case of natural productions a knowledge not confined to the categories of quality cause and effect composition constituents and so on the principle of inward adaptation or design had it been kept to and carried out in scientific application would have led to a different and higher method of observing nature if we adopt this principle the idea when all limitations were removed from it would appear as follows the universality moulded by reason and described as the absolute and final end or the good would be realised in the world and realised moreover by means of a third thing the power which proposes this end as well as realises it that is god thus in him who is the absolute truth those oppositions of universal and individual subjective and objective are solved and explained to be neither self-subsistent nor true but good which is thus put forward as the final cause of the world has been already described as only our good the moral law of our practical reason this being so the unity in question goes no further than make the state of the world and the course of its events harmonise with our moral standards besides even with this limitation the final cause or good is a vague abstraction and the same vagueness attaches to what is to be duty but further this harmony is met by the revival and reassertion of the antithesis which by its own principle had nullified the harmony is then described as merely subjective something which merely ought to be and which at the same time is not real a mere article of faith possessing a subjective certainty but without truth or that objectivity which is proper to the idea this contradiction may seem to be disguised by adjourning the realization of the idea to a future to a time when the idea will also be but a sensuous condition like time is the reverse of a reconciliation of the discrepancy and infinite progression which is the corresponding image adopted by the understanding and the very face of it only repeats and reenacts the contradiction a general remark may still be offered on the result to which the critical philosophy led as to the nature of knowledge a result which has grown one of the current idols or axiomatic beliefs of the day in every dualistic system and especially in that of kant the fundamental defect makes itself visible in the inconsistency of unifying at one moment what a moment before had been explained to be 
independent and therefore incapable of unification and then at the very moment after unification has been alleged to be the truth we suddenly come upon the doctrine that the two elements which in their true status of unification have been refused all independent subsistence are only true and actual in their state of separation philosophizing of this kind wants the little penetration needed to discover that this shuffling only evidences how unsatisfactory each one of the two terms is and it fails simply because it is incapable of bringing the two thoughts together and in point of form there are never more than two it argues an utter want of consistency to say on the one hand that the understanding only knows phenomena and on the other assert the absolute character of this knowledge by such statements as cognition can go no further here is the natural and absolute limit of human knowledge but natural is the wrong word here the things of nature are limited and are natural things only to such an extent as they are not aware of their universal limit or to such extent as their mode or quality is a limit from our point of view and not from their own no one knows or even feels that anything is a limit or defect until he is at the same time above and beyond it living beings for example possess the privilege of pain which is denied to the inanimate even with living beings a single motor quality passes into the feeling of a negative for living beings as such possess within them a universal vitality which overpasses and includes the single mode and thus as they maintain themselves in the negative of themselves they feel the contradiction to exist within them but the contradiction is within them only so far as one and the same subjects include both the universality of their sense of life and the individual mode which is in negation with it the illustration will show how a limit or imperfection in knowledge comes to be turned a limit or imperfection only when it is compared to the actually present idea of the universal of a total imperfect a very little consideration might show that to call a thing finite or limited proves by implication the very presence of the infinite and unlimited that our knowledge of a limit can only be when the unlimited is on this side in consciousness the result however of kant's view of cognition suggests a second remark the philosophy of kant could have no influence on the method of sciences it leaves the categories and method of ordinary knowledge quite unmolested occasionally it may be in the first sections of a scientific work of that period we find propositions borrowed from the kantian philosophy but the course of the treatise renders it apparent that that these propositions were superfluous decoration and that the first few pages might have been omitted without producing the least change in empirical contents we may next institute a comparison of kant with the metaphysics of the empirical school natural plain empiricism though it unquestionably insists most upon sensuous perception still allows a supersensible world of spiritual reality whatever may be its structure and constitution whether derived from intellect or from imagination etc so far as form goes the facts of this supersensible world rest on the authority of mind in the same way as other facts embraced in empirical knowledge rest on authority of external perception but when empiricism becomes reflective and logically consistent it turns its arms against this dualism in the ultimate and highest species of fact it denies the independence of the thinking principle and of spiritual world which develops itself in thought materialism or naturalism therefore is the consistent and thoroughgoing system of empiricism in direct opposition to such empiricism kant asserts the principle of thought and freedom and attaches himself to the first mentioned form of empirical doctrine the general principles of which he never departed from there is a dualism in his philosophy also on one side stands the world of sensation and of the understanding which reflects upon it this world it is true he alleges to be a world of appearances but that is only a title or formal description and the modes of observation continue quite the same as in empiricism on the other side an independent stands a self-apprehending thought the principle of freedom which kant has in common with ordinary and bygone metaphysic but emptied of all that it held and without his being able to infuse into it anything new for in the critical doctrine thought or as it is there called reason is divested of every specific form and thus bereft of all authority the main effect of the kantian philosophy has been to revive the consciousness of reason or the absolute inwardness of thought the abstractness indeed prevented that inwardness from developing into anything or from originating any special forms whether cognitive principles or moral laws but nevertheless it absolutely refused to accept or indulge anything possessing the character of externality henceforth the principle of the independence of reason or of its absolute self-subsistence is made a general principle of philosophy as well as a foregone conclusion of the time 
the critical philosophy has one great negative merit it has brought home the conviction that the categories of understanding are finite in their range and any cognitive process confined within their pale falls short of the truth but kant only had a sight of half the truth he explained the finite nature of the categories to mean that they were subjective only valid only for our thought from which the thing in itself was divided by an impassable gulf in fact however it is not because they are subjective that the categories are finite they are finite by their very nature and it is on their own selves that it is requisite to exhibit their finitude kant however holds that what we think is false because it is we who think it a further deficiency in the system is that it gives only a historical description of thought and a mere enumeration of the factors of consciousness the enumeration is in the main correct but not a word touches upon the necessity of what is thus empirically colligated the observations made on the various stages of consciousness culminate in the summary statement that the content of all we are acquainted with is only an appearance and as it is true at least that all finite thinking is concerned with appearances so far the conclusion is justified the stage of appearance however the phenomenal world is not the terminus of thought there is another and a higher region but the region was to the kantian philosophy an inaccessible other world after all it was only formally that the kantian system established the principle that thought is spontaneous and self-determining into details of the manner and the extent of the self-determination of thought kant never went it was fichte who first noticed the omission and who after he called attention to the want of a deduction for the categories endeavoured really to supply something of the kind with fichte the ego is the starting point in the philosophical development and the outcome of its action is supposed to be visible in the categories but in fichte the ego is not really present as a free spontaneous energy it is supposed to receive its first excitation by a shock or impulse from without against this shock the ego will it is assumed react and only through this reaction does it first become conscious of itself meanwhile the nature of the impulse remains a stranger beyond our pale and the ego with something else always confronting it is weighed with a condition fichte in consequence never advanced beyond kant's conclusion that the finite only is knowable while the infinite transcends the range of thought what kant calls the thing by itself fichte calls the impulse from without the abstraction of something else than i not otherwise describable or definable than as a negative or non-ego in general the i is thus looked at as standing in essential relation with the not i through which its acts of self-determination is first awakened and in this manner the i is but the continuous act of self-liberation from this impulse never gaining a real freedom because with the surcease of the impulse of the i whose being is its action would also cease to be nor is the content produced by the action of the eye at all different from the ordinary content of experience except by the supplementary remark that this content is mere appearance end of part three of chapter four recording by ryan smallwood